in leadership positions. Hopefully every one of you uh, are being shepherded by somebody and you are shepherding somebody else in turn. And I appreciate the kind words and uh, from Justin and uh, I've appreciated Sam's ministry over the years. I consider him to be my shepherd. And uh, so hopefully some of the things I've learned from him I can pass on to other people. Uh, although I think I am a little bit older than he is. Uh, looking at us, you might not know that. But uh, <laughs> nevertheless, uh, if you do have your Bibles, I would invite you uh, to turn to Matthew chapter 28 for our time in God's Word this morning. In a few minutes, I'd like to begin reading at verse 16. At 11 p.m., April 14, way back in the year 1912, there was a large ship by the name of the USS Californian hauling freight from Liverpool, England to Boston, Massachusetts. At that point, the captain ordered the boat to shut down because one of the lookouts looking to the north had seen some ice in the water. The captain knew they were running ahead of schedule. Nothing critical about the freight on board. Let's shut it down. We'll wait till the morning when we have a better view of what's going on. At the same time, another lookout looked to the southeast. In the far distance, there was another large boat. And the captain said, out of courtesy, using our blinking light, let's flash them a Morse code message. Ice spotted, caution advised. The ship was too far away to see the light, and yet the crew was gratified when at about 11.40, that boat came to a stop. Shortly after, several lights went out. They concluded it must be a passenger ship because often around midnight, the captain of these boats would order the lights out to encourage the passengers to go to bed. Midnight came on the USS Californian. A new watch came on deck, including a man by the name of Herbert Stone. At 12.45 a.m., Herbert Stone recorded in his logbook that that boat to the southeast had fired a distress rocket. A few minutes later, a second, a third, in just a few minutes, five in total. At that point, he decided to wake up the captain of the boat, a man by the name of Stanley Lord. He told him what he'd seen, the captain's question was this, were any of those rockets colored? And if so, were they our company colors? No, they were all white, all distress rockets. The captain said, go back up on deck, keep watching, let me know if anything else develops. He went back to sleep. A sixth rocket was fired, a seventh, and at 1.40 a.m., an eighth and final rocket, all recorded in the logbook. At that point, another lookout by the name of Gibson came up to Stone, and those two men had one of the strangest and saddest conversations the world has ever heard. Stone looked at Gibson and said, doesn't that boat look a little bit queer? That was the word he used, almost like the back end is coming out of the water and it's sliding down. They decided to again wake up the captain, told him what they'd seen. Same question, were the rockets that you just saw colored what about company colors? Nope. Well, the captain said things look a little bit odd at night. Uh, go back, keep looking, but let's wait till the morning and we'll see what's really going on. 98% uh, of you know that that boat they were looking at to the southeast was the RMS Titanic. Over 1,500 people died because the Californian took a wait and see attitude. At the inquest that followed the sinking, it was concluded that had the Californian gone to the site of the Titanic when they first began to see the rockets, all 1,500 people would have been saved. The boat was big enough to accommodate them all. When I first read that story several years ago, I couldn't help but think of the relationship between the church and the world. We stand behind our pulpits and we observe. And we see all of the distress rockets that are fired up by the world. We see the crime, we see the divorce, the child abuse, the suicide, the despair, the immorality. We listen to things on the radio and watch things on television. And again, we still stand behind our pulpits with a critical mouth and watch the world as it slowly slides into hell one by one. 
Now, that is something the Lord Jesus was very concerned about. Uh, let me read you some familiar uh, words from John chapter 10 and verse 16. We're talking about shepherding, and with that in mind, Jesus said this, Other sheep I have which are not of this fold. In other words, they're not believers yet. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold or one flock and one shepherd. We need to be united in Jesus Christ. That is the passion of the Lord Jesus, and that's the idea that emerges from Matthew 28, beginning at verse 16. Notice what's here, and as I read this, and you'll see this in the book that you have in front of you, the word all is used four times. Now, I'm not the first to notice, notice this, obviously, but I'd like to use this as a simple outline this morning. Four times the word all is going to appear, and I think there's significance to that. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power, all dominion, all authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Now let me pause and remind you of something we heard yesterday. That word teach in verse 19 in the Old King James ought to be translated, make disciples. Uh, you shepherd these people. You bring them into the fold, and then you feed them. You help them grow. Verse 20, teaching them to observe all things. Again, part of shepherding. Whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you all way, or all ways, all days, even unto the end of the world. These are the marching orders of the church. Let me begin with a question. If you take this seriously, how do you deal with this question? I think of a Jewish person that comes up to me and says, what right do you have to proselytize Jewish people? We have our own religion, leave us alone. We don't need your religion, you've got no right to come and talk to our people. It seems to me there's only two legitimate answers you can answer, and one of them is a little bit difficult, the second one. The first one is, it seems to me we can argue we love these people, and because we love them, we do not want to see them in hell, and therefore we're going to tell them about how they can reach heaven. Secondly, and this is a little awkward with somebody that doesn't believe in Jesus Christ, but Christ has commanded us. He's told us to do this. That is where our authority comes from. It reminds me a little bit of Adam and Eve. When God created Adam and Eve, he gave them authority on the earth. He said, be fruitful and multiply. He tells us the very same thing. You be fruitful, you go out there and you multiply. And so we do it because of that. Now, at this point in Matthew, uh, the author does something that I find quite interesting and quite unique. He doesn't end his biographical gospel the way that the other synoptic gospels do, Mark and Luke. They end with the ascension. If we were writing a biography of Jesus Christ, I suspect 90% of us would end that way. Here's his earthly life, his birth, his life, his teaching, the cross, the resurrection, and now he goes into heaven and that's the end of his earthly life. Matthew doesn't do that. He seems to find something extra special in these words of Christ that make him end here. He doesn't even end with the resurrection. That probably would be our second point of stoppage if we were writing this. Um, if you study these things, and depending how you count and how you read and interpret, you'll realize that there are about 10 post-resurrection appearances of the Lord Jesus described in the New Testament. Again, depending on you, how you count and interpret, in eight of those, you will see that the word go is given. And instead of having you turn to all of these, let me just have you look at this chapter. Look at verse 7. The women have come to the tomb. Uh, they meet the angel. And what does the angel tell them in verse 7? And go quickly and tell his disciples. Skip down to verse 10. Now the women come to the Lord Jesus, and what does Jesus tell them to do? Then said Jesus unto them, be not afraid, go tell my brethren. And then you come to verse 19, go ye therefore. The idea is clear. The news 
about the death of the Lord Jesus Christ in his resurrection is something we do not want to keep to ourselves. We are to go and we are to proclaim this. It is absolutely significant. Now, the early disciples, the people to whom Christ was speaking, took this very, very seriously. And you know what happened. We have the record of scripture. They went into the world and gave this news and thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people were saved. Now that was then, and this is now. And what is called the Great Commission is now what some people call the Great Omission. And you know that when something is omitted, it is left out, it is undone, it is neglected. And instead of taking the gospel to the ends of the earth, as the Lord commanded, today we won't even take it to the end of the street. Now these words were given to these 11, but indirectly they're given to us as well. This is our responsibility. Now it's always a dangerous thing to play with statistics. You can ask questions in a poll or survey that predetermine the answer. You're aware of that. You can pick whatever statistics you want to prove anything. But I'm going to cite just a couple that are very sobering to me. These come from the Gallup Association. And they surveyed an awful lot of people that called themselves Christians. And the results said that 95% of those people have never won somebody else to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, don't respond to this. It's not my intent here to embarrass anybody. But if I ask you to honestly respond to that question, have you ever led somebody to the Lord? It would not surprise me, but what 50% or more would say, I've never done that. Now, I understand in some instances there's legitimate reasons for that. I think of William Carey. How long was he in India before anybody got saved? But for the most part, uh, you know, William Carey was preaching the gospel. Our problem is we're not. And as a result of that, people are not getting saved. 80% of Christians do not consistently witness for the Lord, whether it's in the assembly to Sunday school kids or young people, boys club, girls club, whatever it may be. Less than 2% are involved in the ministry of evangelism. And here's one that irritates me no end. 71% uh, don't even give to evangelism. Now, again, I'm not meaning to be critical here, but the people in this auditorium, for the most part, probably in the upper, I would dare say, 1% of the world's income, the only exceptions might be evangelists. What do we do to support evangelism? I'm going to come back to this thought in a few minutes, but uh, I look at the truck that I drive and the house that I live in, and I think, do I really need this much? Are there other people that need it more than I do? And what do I do with that thought? Um, Wednesday night, we were talking a little bit about laying up treasure in heaven. I can pull that $20 bill out of my pocket, and I can use that to invite somebody out for coffee or a meal, and I can talk to them and get to know them and eventually lead them to the Lord, and they'll end up in heaven. That's a way to store up treasure in heaven. Are we doing that? It seems to me it would be very easy to do that for most of us. Um, the Lord Jesus said, I have all authority in heaven. That ought to give us comfort because he is sovereign. If he is really in control, then we have every reason to expect success when we go out and preach the gospel. God says, I'm going to bless you. If I've given you these marching orders, I'm going to be behind you. He also says he has authority in earth. Who's living in earth? We are. If he gave that command, if he says, I've got authority in earth, he's got authority over us. If he tells us to go, we better be obeying that acknowledging that, doing what's right, and so forth. Now, point number two, there's all authority. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about all nations. And I'm going to warn you up front that I'm going to spend quite a bit of time on this point. So when you're looking at your watches and you realize I have only five minutes left and you think I'm not even to point three and we've got four to go, don't despair. I know what time I'm supposed to quit. But I think this point is absolutely essential. How are we going to reach all nations? Number one, 
I think we've got to proclaim the gospel boldly. Keep your finger here, but turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Those of you who are serious Bible students know that there probably is no better text on the ministry in all the Bible than 2 Corinthians. Uh, chapter 3, one of my favorite chapters of the Bible, I want to point out something in verses 12 and 13. Verse 12 of 2 Corinthians 3 says, Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness. A better word is boldness of speech. Then he goes on and draws a comparison. A contrast. He says, and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. Now, you probably understand the story that's referred to here. Moses goes up to Mount Sinai. He gets the stone tablets. He comes down, and what does he see? All of the immorality around the golden calf. And what does he do? He boldly smashes those stone tablets to the ground. He tells the Levites to get their sword and go kill those people. And 3,000 people die. To me, that is bold preaching. And Paul says, no, don't be timid. Don't be modest, hesitant like Moses was. You preach boldly. Now, I think of that and I say, wow. Uh, I told you Wednesday night, I am introverted, shy. Uh, I told one group the other day, I work in a building with 150 people. We had to take a personality test. I turned out to be the shyest, most, most introverted person in the entire building. I'm the last person that ought to be standing up here in front. But when I read that, I think God is saying this to shy people as well. Do we take this seriously? We need to proclaim boldly the gospel of Jesus Christ. It goes on, I think. He says that veil over his face. Now, you understand why that was there based on what we read in the Old Testament. Uh, Moses, being in the presence of God, reflected the glory of God. It was so intense, people couldn't stand to look at him. But Paul said there's a second reason for that veil. The glory of his face was fading. And God didn't want, or Moses didn't want, the people to see that. Now, it was a picture of the Old Testament. Glorious, brilliant, fantastic in its day, doing exactly what God wanted it to do. Proving to all of us that we cannot keep the law. We are short. We fall short of the glory and law of God. But that glory is fading when the greater glory of the new covenant comes along. The analogy typically used is that of the moon and the sun. You walk out at midnight, there's a full moon, your eye is instinctively drawn to that. It's a glorious sight. But what about when the sun comes up? It's noon. You look up into the sky and maybe there's a full moon up there and you can see it if you look hard, but your eye is not drawn to that. Your eye is drawn to the sun, the greater glory. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. So if Moses is willing to boldly proclaim the Old Testament law, how much more should we boldly proclaim the New Testament law? That of Jesus Christ. Not only do we need to proclaim this boldly, but I think we need zeal, passion, intensity. Turn again to Psalm 14. Um, I am intrigued by the passions that people have and I'm no exception. Um, you look around and there are people who are passionate about the World Cup soccer tournament. There are people who are passionate about the NFL, people passionate about quilting or making maple syrup or whatever it may be. Why aren't we that passionate about the things of Christ? I think Psalm 14 is one of the most passionate passages in all of scripture. It begins with familiar words. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. God is very conservative with his use of the word fool. I think there's only two people that he calls a fool. One is the atheist here in Psalm 14.1. Uh, it begins in their mind, right? The fool hath said in his heart. Today we would say in his mind. They begin to conclude, I don't need God. I can explain everything without God. And uh, if you're historical, you can go back to Thomas Paine and Charles Darwin and people like that and realize where that thinking comes from today. Also, he calls the rich farmer in Luke. Remember that? He had this abundant harvest. He said, I'll build a big barn, put all the grain in there. I'll be set for life. He didn't think about what was going to happen tomorrow. It's a foolish thing to plan for the future without taking God's will into account. It doesn't stop there. 
Here's God's assessment through David. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. That word abominable, it's a strong word. There's an old southern preacher, he's with the Lord now. He used to say, I said civilization was going to the dogs. I quit doing that out of respect for the dogs. Uh, people are doing, human beings doing inhumane things. Uh, there's some young people here. Uh, let me use an illustration more appropriate for kids. It's about a pig that got into the liquor and got drunk and did all kinds of crazy things. The next day, he sobers up, he's embarrassed, he calls all of the pigs together, and he says, look, uh, I got drunk yesterday, I acted in a crazy, stupid fashion, uh, I acted like a human being. I'm, I'm telling you, I am so sorry for that, it is never going to happen again. You look at some of the things that people do today, and I don't mean to be overly grim here, but you think about abortion. You think about partial birth abortion. How can people do that? You think about what happened in World War II in Poland and Germany, and you say, how can people do that? Um, uh, don't read anything into my politics here. You'll probably misinterpret, but uh, I have a physics background, metallurgy. You heard about that. And uh, when we were in college, we had to do some calculations uh, related to the atomic bomb. Uh, there was a guy that did some work on that, and he had us do the calculations, let us through them, and so forth. And uh, atomic energy, what's the first purpose it was put to? A hundred thousand people died in Hiroshima when material that wouldn't even fill a thimble exploded. Now, you know they started out with something that was a little bigger than a softball, cut it in half and then blew it together. But when that material exploded, it blew the rest of the uranium apart so that it never even went, right? Um, now, I, I'm conflicted about the use of that bomb. My dad was in World War II in the South Pacific. Had they not dropped the bomb, he would have been part of the group invading Japan, and I might not even be here today had that been the case. So uh, the, the point is not whether it was right or wrong. The point is that when we get this new technology, the first thing we want to do is harm other people. That's what God is concerned about here. Verse 2, the Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. Now, you might not care about your neighborhood going to hell, but God does. God is very concerned about what goes on on the earth. That's what this verse tells us. I don't know if you have trouble with discipline in your family, in your boys club, girls club, chapel, whatever it may be, VBS. We do on occasion, and it used to be that when we did, we called the boys aside and said, look, your behavior is important because you're important. You're important to God, therefore you're important to us, therefore your behavior is important to us, and there's a certain conduct, a standard of conduct you're expected to follow, and that's why. God cares about human beings. And it goes on. Uh, this is heaven's testimony about the earth. Verse 3, they are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Have all the workers of iniquity no knowledge? Don't they understand what they're doing? Don't they understand what their destiny is? This is terrible. And God says, I want my people to have the same view of the earth that I have. Now, notice the first phrase of verse 7. In my opinion, if you take away a couple of statements of the Lord when he was hanging on the cross, this is the most passionate phrase in the entire Bible. Oh, that the salvation of Israel were come out of Zion. If David were writing this today, I think he would say, Oh, that the salvation of my neighborhood would come out of my assembly. Oh, that the salvation of the world would come out of the church. Very passionate words. And uh, where is our passion? The world needs to be reconciled to God. Do you know the name Elizabeth Barrett Browning? If you study English literature, you will. A famous poet. Uh, before she got married, she was Elizabeth Barrett, growing up in a fairly well-to-do home. Um, 
her dad was a bit of a tyrant. He made it clear that he did not want her or any of her many brothers to ever get married, at least until he died, because their responsibility was to take care of him. Now you think, what kind of a man would say that? And yet that's what he taught those kids. Uh, Elizabeth uh, had some problems when she was young, and as a result of that, a childhood accident, she uh, was a semi-invalid. And she thought, well, nobody's going to pay attention to me anyway. But a poet by the name of Robert Browning did. And uh, he wrote to the parents and family saying, I would like to court Elizabeth. Absolutely not. You leave her alone. Even the brother said no. They told Elizabeth, that man is after your money. That's the only reason he's interested in you. Who's interested in an invalid? And yet, Robert Browning persisted. They ended up getting married. They moved to Italy. When they did, the family disowned her. She began to write letters back to her family. Year after year, every week, she wrote one or two letters pleading for reconciliation. Several years after, Elizabeth gets a big box in the mail from England. All those letters unopened. People today have looked at those letters and read them and said, if the family had read just a few of those letters, they were so filled with passion and pleading for reconciliation that they would have had to have had a very cold heart not to have restored fellowship. God has sent us a letter pleading for reconciliation. That's the word of God. But the world is not reading that. They rely on us to go take that word of reconciliation to them. Uh, well, uh, heartfelt passion. Uh, you can't miss that here. Why don't we have it? I'm not sure. Uh, I, I think it was the 1980s. I should have looked this up. But uh, some of you who are older will remember that there were a bunch of whales that were beached in Alaska. Um, and it was quite significant because the U.S. and Russia were still in the Cold War, and yet Canada, the United States, and Russia all cooperated to save those whales. The world media was focused on that event, and everybody's cheering for these people trying to get the whales back into the deep water. At the same period of time, on the Horn of Africa, there were tens of thousands of people starving to death. Very little media attention. And to this day, I still scratch my head and I wonder why the disparity there. Whales? People? And I don't have an answer, quite honestly. I think part of it is we can look and listen to the, what's going on with the whales and we can have sort of a dispassionate interest, a sort of a distance there, if you will. Uh, we can be passively interested, but when we start thinking about people, it demands that we become personally involved. You recall we talked about that Wednesday night as well. The Lord Jesus called us to personal involvement in the lives of other people. We watch those people starving, most of them probably ending up in hell, and it doesn't affect us enough to do anything about it. If we love people the way that Christ did, if we really believe in hell, we'd be doing something about it. That's what uh, David is saying here in this psalm. We need commitment. We need compulsion, exhortation. We need to be constrained. Do you remember what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, going back to that letter again, about the ministry? For the love of Christ constraineth me. The love of Christ, it's pointed in two directions. The love Christ has for other people and the love of Christ as a character trait compels me. It constrains me. Paul says, I've got no choice. Um, a week and a half ago, I was in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And uh, I had a niece and a nephew. They're thinking about college. And I took them up there to uh, look at several colleges up there. And Upper Peninsula of Michigan is, is spectacular. Um, now, it's early in the morning. You'll forgive me if I'm a little bit silly here, right? Um, I consider Alexander Curry a good friend. I've benefited from conversations with him, from his ministry, and so forth. So I'm willing to give him a little bit of slack and tolerance and other people from... Uh, he mentioned uh, Texas, was it? I think that's how you pronounce it, um, as being a nice place to be from. I'm sure he was a little stressed for time. But had he had more time, 
I'm sure he would have brought up Michigan, and especially the Upper Peninsula, right? The Lower Peninsula is just a defensive barrier to keep people out of the pretty part of Michigan, but it's spectacular up there, and uh, there are lots of rivers and waterfalls and mountains and the whole bit, and there's one river called the Miner's River, uh, lots of minerals in the Upper Peninsula, iron and copper and a little bit of silver and so forth, and uh, they called it the Miner's River, and there's about a quarter mile stretch where it runs. It's not very wide, maybe about five yards wide, 15 feet, and uh, sheer cliffs on either side, about 20 feet high, just pure rock, no trees, no vegetation, no nothing. If you're on a boat floating down the Miner's River and you're in that stretch, you stay in that boat and you just go where the river's gonna take you. Paul says, that is what's happened to me. The love of Christ forces me to get out there and preach the gospel. And so we ought to do that as well. That's the idea here. Now, we need to proclaim boldly. We need the zeal in the passion. We even need to be constrained by the love of Christ. But if we're in love with Christ, it'll happen. Also, I think, and now I want to get a bit practical here, we need to have a worldwide mindset. Turn with me to Acts chapter 13. And I realize I'm taking you all over the place, but uh, I think there's great profit in looking at something in the first couple of verses here. You know this is the start of the first missionary journey. And uh, I want to read the first couple of verses. It says, Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas in Simeon that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Menaean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul as they ministered to the Lord. Now, let me stop there just for a moment. These names are somewhat familiar to us, especially a couple of them, because they did remarkable things. Um, if we look at Barnabas, for example, we know from other parts of Scripture that he was a Levite. He was from Cyprus, an island uh, in the eastern Mediterranean. So he probably had an interest in both the Jewish and the Gentile cultures. Um, the nephew that I talked about taking to the Upper Peninsula. Uh, his mother is my sister. My sister worked in Japan for several years, married a Japanese man, so they're half Japanese. Uh, while we were driving, they were keeping track of the soccer tournament on their uh, cell phones. And Ethan said, you know what, I've got two cultures I am rooting for, the United States and Japan. I think that's what Barnabas would have said. I am interested in both Jewish people and Gentile people. I want to see them all saved. Let's go to Simeon, who is called Niger. Niger means black. The assumption is he came from Africa. So where is his passion going to be? If we look at Lucius, seemingly he was already a missionary. We get that from Acts 11, verse 20. He probably had an interest in Greek-speaking areas of the world, but... Uh, from Cyrene, uh, northern Africa, a little bit uh, west of uh, uh, where Simeon uh, probably was from, although now I've got to think about my geography. We don't know exactly where he was from, but uh, Simeon, <clears throat> but uh, uh, interested in different cultures. Now we come to Menaean. We read that he was raised with royalty. He probably was interested in political leaders and business leaders and the, the top echelon of society. And then you come to this guy by the name of Saul, we call him Paul, an intellectual giant. Historians say one of the six brightest minds ever to walk the face of the earth. Had a passion for teaching the word of God and seeing souls saved. A passion for starting new work. Now, what strikes me is that these guys were the prophets in teachers. These were the top dogs. Forgive me for being flippant about that. These were the best the assembly had to offer. They knew the scriptures. They were in touch with the Lord. They were the guys that were ministering. They were fasting and so forth. They were the kind of people that you would say, our assembly cannot afford to lose them. And yet, who gets sent? I grew up in a Baptist church. When I was a kid, didn't know anything about the assemblies. Didn't know 
uh, until I got to think about how old I was, but born in 52, 86, so you do the math. And uh, somebody said, you're interested in Bible study. We have a midweek Bible study at Martin Road Gospel Chapel. I didn't know anything about that, but I showed up and I thought, you know, this is kind of impressive. All of these people sitting around in a square and, and uh, all the way from a guy that was 98 at the time to my newborn baby. And, and uh, so we came back and came back and, and uh, we started to think, you know, these people seem to be doing things the right way. We asked one of the older guys, what do you believe? His response was, come and observe. That night driving home, I turned to my wife. I said, this is a cult. They don't want to tell us what they believe. And it took us six months before we ever came to a Sunday night meeting. And I think it was about another two months before we ever came to a Sunday morning meeting, the breaking of bread. It took us that long. Uh, you people are strange, right? No, that's not it at all. Now you know I'm passionate about the assemblies. But um, when I was growing up in the Baptist church, and I'm going to use hyperbole. I'm going to exaggerate to make a point. Uh, missionary speakers would come in, and their testimony would be something like this. Uh, I started out as a carpenter. But every time I built a house, it fell down and nobody would hire me. So I decided to be a plumber. And every time I finished, the basement flooded out. So I decided to be an electrician. And when the occupant turned on the light switch, the house burned down. So I was a failure at everything. So it was obvious the Lord was leading me into missionary activity. <laughs> and I scratched my head and I came to the conclusion, instead of being a missionary, I better be a physicist. Um, <clears throat> that really had something to do with my thinking. Um, I came to the assemblies, and again, didn't know anything about them, but on the Tuesday night meetings, <clears throat> on occasion, they had, had some missionary speakers in. And it might have been, you realize how I mean this phrase, that luck of the draw, I don't mean it literally, but here come these missionaries in, and I listened to those guys, and I said, these are bright people. These are passionate people. These are hard workers. Why is it the Baptists send out the failures? Now, that's not really true. Again, I want to underline, when I'm traveling and there's no assembly in the area on a weekend, I will go to a Baptist church. Uh, and I still, you know, uh, good friends with those, respect them and listen to them and all that sort of thing. But in the assemblies, they take the best and the brightest and send them out. That is what this group was doing here in Acts chapter 13. Um, all right, so they send them out. They've got a worldwide mindset. Uh, you probably have the same thing. Now, I assume and would hope that the majority of you have a passion for seeing souls saved in India and the United States and Canada, uh, even Texas, uh, I'm not sure if that's part of the United States or not, but uh, we, we ought to be passionate about people all over everywhere. And uh, yeah, now that I've lost half the audience here, and, uh, <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> well, we also have to establish contact. Turn over a couple pages to Acts chapter 17. And uh, Paul, uh, you know, the, the famous part of this chapter is at the end, uh, Mars Hill and all the rest of it, but uh, notice the first couple of verses of Acts 17. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, there was a synagogue of the Jews, an important phrase, and Paul, as his manner, his habit, his custom was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures. Paul establishes contact. In Matthew, we are told that we are the salt of the earth. Salt doesn't do any good unless it's in contact with the food. If you want your popcorn to taste good, there better be, better be salt on it. If you want the salt to preserve the meat, it better be in contact with the meat. If we're going to have an impact on the culture around us, we better be in contact with those people. Um, people who have studied such things have pointed out that there are more than 1,400 references to cities in the Bible. And there are more than 25 studies of a particular mission to a city in the New Testament. And Acts is a great illustration of that. Where does the book of Acts begin? Jerusalem, most important city in the world. Where does the book of Acts end? Rome, most important secular city in the world. And in between, there's dozens of cities that are described. Um, I'm more of a country person, but if you think Paul had a sharp idea here, and I do, most of us have an advantage. We live in large cities. Lots of people around us. 
Paul's strategy seemed to be focused on the cities. He moved to a city, he preached, he established a church, and he used that then for further outreach into distant communities. Um, the problem is uh, we don't take advantage of it. We live in these great metropolitan complexes, but what do we do? We need to find points of contact. Uh, to steal the analogy from Alex yesterday, uh, the engine in our Ford F-150 pickup is fine. The transmission is okay. But maybe we need to realign. We need to refocus, redirect some of the things that we're doing. Um, do you know the name Alexander McLaren? Uh, one of the top preachers of all time. Keep in mind, he was a preacher, used to speaking to large congregations. Here's what he wrote. It is better for most of us to fish with the rod than with the net, to angle for single souls rather than to try and enclose a multitude at once. Preaching to a congregation has its own place and value, but private and personal talk, honestly and wisely done, will affect more than preaching. Now, don't raise your hand here, and I realize most of you probably grew up in a Christian home and that's why you're a believer, but ask most people, how did you get saved? Very few will say, well, I went to a Billy Graham evangelistic campaign or Luis Palau or any of these other people. They got saved because an individual cared about them and shared the gospel with them. That's what McLaren has in mind. Um, we have the responsibility of proclaiming the gospel, and we've got more stuff to do that with today than any other time in history. Think about the home you live in. Most of them are very nice, very elegant. Anybody would love to come there to visit you. You have a microwave oven. You have coffee makers. Showing hospitality is easy today. Um, I was thinking about this uh, this winter. Uh, it was 12 below zero. I, it really doesn't get this cold in Michigan. We just say this to keep the riffraff out. Um, but uh, 12 below zero, and I'm driving to some meeting, and I'm sitting in my pickup, and I'm thinking, you know what, 12 below outside, and I am sitting here without a coat on, in my shirt sleeves, and perfectly comfortable. The chair that I'm sitting in is as comfortable as any chair I have in my living room. What would uh, George Whitfield, John Wesley, do with a Ford F-150 pickup? Um, you know this place is called Indiana Wesleyan University, right? Named after John Wesley. You go to their library here. I did this the other day. And uh, there are the writings of John Wesley. It takes up, I, I'm not exaggerating, books on the shelf this wide, the writings. Uh, another section, the preaching, the sermons of John Wesley. Um, the biography, biographies of John Wesley, probably that much. Uh, he rode a horse to 150,000 miles, preached 40,000 times. Now, I grew up on a farm, still have a farm, don't have a horse anymore, but uh, today if I get on a horse and if I ride for about a half hour, I am sore. 250,000 miles? That, that's incredible. Um, he was comfortable in front of large groups, Alexander McLaren, not everybody is. Okay? There are other ways that you can approach contact. Um, some people love to go door to door. They're just excited about see what's gonna, seeing what's going to happen. Um, other people, they have different interests. Uh, years ago at Martin Road, where I come from, there were three men that were passionate about the outside. Two of those men are with the Lord now. There's one still there. But they decided to start a boys club. And they would take these boys camping and fishing and outdoor activities and all that sort of thing. One of the boys was quite rowdy, uh, just a disruptive influence, and they just struggled with him. He never got saved, as far as we know. We still know him today. But uh, he went off, and he eventually got married and had kids of his own. When his oldest boy was 10 years old, that boy was a little bit rowdy. And he said, you know what? That boy needs Martin Road Gospel Chapel Boys Club. And he took the boy there. After a few years, that boy made a profession of faith. His sister and his brother made professions of faith because of something that had happened, a sacrifice on the part of these three men that were doing something that they really enjoyed, were passionate about some 30, 35 years prior. Have you ever heard the story about a man? He grew up in, in Switzerland. All of a sudden, the name escapes me now, but he moved to Quebec. And on weekends, he would pass out tracks. And he went to an island called St. Pierre, I think it was, in the water, and uh, around Quebec, and handing out tracts there. Fifty years later, he's in his late 70s, 
he gets a phone call. And the man on the other end said, did you ever pass out papers about Jesus on St. Pierre 50 years ago? And the man said, yeah, I think I did. And the other guy said, well, our dad just died a few weeks back, and we were cleaning out his house. And we came across one of those papers, and I read it. And as a result of that, I asked some questions to some people, and I ended up getting saved. And I told my wife, and she read the paper, and she got saved. And she told her brother, and he got saved. Three people saved because of what somebody did 50 years before. Uh, something to think about if you're discouraged at things not happening here and now. Um, maybe you're uncomfortable even talking to people. You're introverted like I might be. Well, what about your lifestyle? There is a well-known verse. We just finished studying this a couple months ago at Martin Road. Titus 3.14. Let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses that they be not unfruitful. Paul is tying good works in with fruitfulness. Ephesians 2.10, we are his workmanship. That word uh, workmanship, it's a Greek word, poema. We get our word poem from that word. But it's broader than just poetry. It means any kind of artwork. You've heard the phrase, a picture is worth a thousand words, and it prompts the question, what kind of picture are we to the world about who Jesus Christ is? Are we a magnificent portrait? Or are we like some of this abstract art that you can't make hide nor tail of? Uh, you've heard the story about the multi-million dollar piece of art that was hung upside down in a famous museum. It was three years before anybody realized it was upside down. Um, sometimes our life is lived so carelessly that that's how we look to the world. We need to be careful about that. Uh, some of you ladies, uh, you're maybe a little bit more reserved, but you can make pies and cakes and everything else. You can take those next door. You can become friends with somebody. Again, to borrow the phrase from Alexander McLaren, in the long run, that may be far more effective than what any of us behind a pulpit do. You can have a huge impact here. I was in college in the 1970s. Lots of turmoil, uh, you know, the Vietnam War and all of the rest of it. And uh, I was part of a, a group that was called Campus Crusade. I don't hold hands with everything they do, but they were uh, helpful to me. Um, we heard a couple stories about clever ways of making contact with the world, creative ways. Yikes, I've, I've got a, I didn't watch my watch here. Let me talk 100 miles an hour. A man by the name of Evie Hill, uh, he was a ward captain for the Democratic Party in Dallas, Texas. And uh, his responsibility was to have block captains all throughout Dallas. And so uh, when the election came up, these guys had to knock on every door, hand out Democratic literature, call them on the day of the election, get out and vote for the Democratic Party. He got saved. He said, I can't work for the Democratic Party anymore. I've got to find something else to do. He tried lots of things. It wasn't very successful. He said, look, if I can find block captains for the Democratic Party, I can certainly do this for the Lord Jesus Christ. He moved to Los Angeles. And when we heard the story, 1,900 block captains in the city of Los Angeles. And so when there was an evangelistic campaign, Billy Graham, Luis Palau, whatever, they went out with the literature, they made the phone calls and so forth. A great thing to do. Uh, students were taking over the campuses. Over at University of Paris, a bunch of communists took over the administration building. And uh, they had these two Chinese girls at a table under an awning out on the front steps handing out the little red book written by Chairman Mao, you know, Mao Zedong, right? And uh, Chinese Cultural Revolution and all the rest. The Christians looked at that and said, you know what, maybe we could do something like that. Lots of people are taking those books. They went to a Christian publisher and said, hey, can you make a lot of New Testaments with red covers on it? Made thousands, handed them out, got an Oriental girl to hand them out. And who knows about the numbers, but supposedly 19 people got saved as a result of those New Testaments. We need to be creative. We can think about ways. Uh, we heard the other uh, day, English is a second language. Uh, you can do that and, and see people saved and so forth. Um, all right, all things I think that we understand. Uh, we're the whole counsel of God. If you're going to shepherd somebody, not only do you get them into the fold, but you've got to continue to feed them. Uh, Make them lie down in green pastures. Lead them beside the still waters. We've talked about that already. And then finally, uh, the Lord said he's going to be with us all ways, all days. Matthew seems to be struck by that as well. How is the Lord Jesus introduced in the Gospel of Matthew? Chapter 1, verse 23, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Why? God with us. Go to the middle of the book, Matthew 18, where two or three are gathered together. There I am. 
God with us. Even when you're doing church discipline, I'm with you. And now here at the end, Matthew 28, I am with you always. Uh, quick illustration, and I'll quit. Uh, it comes from the Detroit area. Henry Ford, in the day, richest man in the world. And uh, he bought a massive life insurance policy at one point in time. The Detroit newspapers made a big deal out of that. Henry Ford buys this. Henry Ford had a relative and a friend that sold insurance. When the guy heard that, read the newspaper story, he called Henry and said, is this true? Yeah, it is. Well, you know I shall sell insurance. Why didn't you come to me? Here's the response. You never asked me. How many people that live in our neighborhood will someday say, you never asked me? What a sad thing that would be.